and the kids were being educated. And they wanted their children there. Does that mean there were never any abuses? No, that's not what we're talking about. See, the whole system is being decried. Francis is going to go apologize for the entire system. And wouldn't it be fun, once again, to ask a few questions? Because there are certainly plenty of witnesses out there among the tribes, among the indigenous peoples of Canada, who are wanting to tell the other, the other side of the story. Concert pianist, librettist, novelist, and playwright, Thompson Highway's life has taken him from the trap lines of northern Manitoba to the stages of the world. His plays are studied at universities all over North America, and he has almost single-handedly created a vibrant and viable native theater in Canada. I would think that your life, your adult life, would be more informed by what was probably the dichotomy of your early years, the mm -hmm. more exaggerated... Uh, extremes, I would think, than, than most people would have. Idyllic to start with, certainly less than idyllic as it became later when you were in, in a residential school. Oh, that's a, mis that's a mistake. Is that right? The residential school experience for me was a fantastic experience. Is that right? So much of that is reported, you know, that's, that's, that's uh, skewed. It's not quite right. They don't have the whole picture. There was a lot of us who had positive experiences yeah. in the native residential school. But I am, I've got to say, surprised when you yeah. say that the residential experience was, was a good one for you. Yeah, it was. I, um, learned how to sp I learned how to speak English. Yeah. I learned how to play the piano. That started the residential school, the, the yeah. piano thing. Oh, yeah. Why doesn't he get to tell his side of the story? Plenty of those people up there. None of them get to be heard, though. They don't have a voice because <laughs> it doesn't fit the narrative. Yeah, I took my kids up to um, Lake Superior in Minnesota the other day. And it came across the Church of St. Francis Xavier, where some, for 200 years, from 1700-something to the 1900s, missionaries from Canada braved extreme hardship to minister to the Ojibwe communities up on Lake Superior. The owner of this church walked around with a camera, was so impressed. This little church that you see on the screen right now was founded as a Jesuit mission from Fort William, Ontario, Canada. In 1855. Now today it's just a museum, but the museum makes it really clear that the thing that brought the community up there, both the settlers and the Ojibwe and the tribe, the other tribes, what brought them together was this little church. The community surrounding it thrived because of this little church, because of the Canadian priests, because of the Latin Mass. We're going to do a little documentary on some of these places, in fact. They're all, they're dotting the North Shore of Minnesota up into Canada. And I paged through, ironically enough, a Missale Romanum on the altar there in that little church. I checked the tabernacle and guess what? Saborium, still there. And I want to, just for the sake of justice, natural justice, draw your attention to the fact that our country and Canada were founded by people like this who were doing this, who knew how to love and get along with the tribes, who knew what wanted had a desire to educate and to feed people who didn't have it very, very easy. And in a minute, I'm going to show you a video of how tough it was. And yeah, to teach them about Jesus Christ. You know, these are Canadian missionaries who built this church. We're on the screen right now. They endured hardships like you can't imagine. The Minnesota winters on, <laughs> on Lake Superior, Gitchigumi, the winds off the lake. You know, you imagine living up there in the middle of winter. And they did it because they wanted to educate, feed, and catechize the Ojibwe. You can apologize for that too, Francis. You can apologize for the whole thing. You can apologize for the entire, for the entire divine mandate of our Lord to go out and convert all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy. Is that what you're going to do, Francis? On your little road show. An estimated one-third of Canada's indigenous children spent at least some time in these residential schools from the 1880s through the 1960s. But what, <laughs> see, what they're not going to tell you is that those schools were the only avenue available to ind indigenous children. I mean, I was up on the Manitoba Nunavut border where the nearest piano was like, uh, what, 500, 300 miles away? So I never really got a chance to start until I was 11. So in, in residential school, what, that was something that there you was a just... Piano, there was yeah. a piano there in one of the rooms, and I started to teach myself, and there was a little old nun. It was run by 12 nuns, three priests, and three brothers. And this little old nun picked me up as a student, and I started learning. And Indian parents were the first to appreciate the opportunity. Should they try to educate us. They made mistakes, but they tried. 
Now, the activists say that the indigenous kids were, were, were abused in every way. They were forced, for example, to attend those schools. Well, think about that for a second. <laughs> All Canadian children after 1910 would have been forced to attend schools. Because after 1910, when most, that was when most of the provinces introduced compulsory school legislation. I could say the same thing about the Catholic school I went to. We were forced to go there because you couldn't just sit home in those days and not go to school. You see how easy it is to create a narrative that's much more, much more hideous than, than, than the reality, especially if you have a deep-seated anti-Christian bias? You beginning to see what's going on here? Beginning to be a little bit concerned about what Francis is going to do up there in a couple of days? Is there going to be any mention from the Pope, again, about these priests and these beautiful nuns who left everything behind, left their homes? Well, just for a second, ask yourself, what were they doing up there? Why would they want to go there? Why would anyone want to go up there and live there and do that with your life? They left their homes, moved to Canada to give their to, to, to live in this frozen tundra to try to give their best to educate indigenous peoples in accordance with a government program. Was it all perfect? No, I doubt it. Were they heroes? <laughs> well, I'll take them any day over what the woke flakes in Canada are doing right now to the kids. Drag Kids, it's a feature documentary following four preteen drag queens as they kind of pursue their passion for drag in their hometowns. Um, and they're from Vancouver, Montreal, uh, Spain, and Missouri. And then they all come together for one big group show at Pride Montreal. It's an incredible outlet for self-expression. Yeah, well, that's just fine. The real, the real villains here are the Catholic priests and the nuns <laughs> of the past, of course, long since dead. They can't defend themselves. Heck, even the indigenous language was under attack by these evil Catholic priests, so say the activists up there. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, no, it's not right. It's wrong. The historical records have it exactly the other way around. Two-thirds of the residential schools were administered by the Oblate Fathers, who, in fact... Wait for it. Learned. They studied and learned the native languages. And then guess what they did? They wrote them down in dictionaries and in grammars that are still used to this day. That's what they actually did. They preached the gospel in the indigenous languages, thus helping preserve those languages. Not trying to wipe them out, trying to preserve them. And at the same time, give these native peoples the truth of Jesus Christ. And you can say, well, I don't like Jesus Christ. I'm not a Christian. It's not right. Well, that's what they were there for. That's what they, that's what they were respected for. And the government of Canada acknowledged that they, they could help do this for the indigenous peoples. You look at a map right now of Western Canada, what do you see? Countless towns, rivers, and lakes named after those oblate fathers who built the hospitals, the schools, the churches, the towns all over Canada. When they weren't raping and eating Indian kids, that's what they were doing. Building towns, building hospitals. And then their institutions, their Canadian institutions, and their missionary work, which was world famous by that point, became the basis for a Canadian Catholic missionary outward, outreach throughout the entire world. Is Francis going to apologize for that? Mustn't have proselytism after all. Is Francis even going to mention any of the heroic efforts that went into this process, this project to bring Christ to the peoples of Canada? Will he remind anyone of what these priests actually went through? Let's show a little bit of this, of this documentary and watch it and ask yourself, this is, one of, this is an example of one of the priests who Justin Trudeau is accusing of being a racist, rapist, hating son of a gun. But here's what he actually looked like. Et mes tantes avaient choisi chacune son missionnaire. Et on m'a demandé, t'aimes ça écrire, toi, Paul? Euh, pourquoi est-ce que tu prendrais pas ton missionnaire, toi aussi? Alors, on m'a donné le père André Goussard, qui était un Belge, qui était au Nunavut, dans des missions euh, très éloignées. It was very solitary. Mission here was not only uh, teaching religion, they have to work 
to survive. They have to go seal hunting. They have to fish to survive. First, they live in igloo, just like the rest of the people in the community, for the sake of uh, converting people. When we came there as a commissioner, we saw this misery there for us. I couldn't go to the people without doing something. We had to ameliorate the situation, make a world better. Il avait construit une maison là en roche, le Ferrari. Et je couchais dans le toit, sur des pots de caribou. <rire> Il me racontait, dans ce temps-là, les enfants étaient envoyés dans des écoles et ils revenaient passer l'été chez leurs parents. Et euh, il lui ramenait les enfants. Alors, on est parti de Baker Lake, 5 pour l'île de King William. Parce que le temps était mauvais, on atterrissait parce que c'était sur ski, un petit avion de Norseman. Ça nous prenait trois jours par avion pour arriver à Joeven. Le père du Liard à Gary Lake est mort en octobre dernier, perdu dans une poudrerie à quelques milles de sa mission. Ça, c'était déjà quelque chose qui brisait le cœur. I'm glad that Andrew Gustav has walked in this community. He lives a very fond, strong memory in my heart, in a way. I learned a lot from Manda Gushai, not only as a priest, man of God, but as a human being. But according to Francis, this is just another example of a racist colonialist. Because all of these heroes of the past who can no longer defend themselves have been tried and convicted by the same people up in Canada, by the way, who told the world that the Freedom Convoy was a hate group, a bunch of Nazis. I want to be very clear. We are not intimidated by those who hurl insults and abuse at small business workers and steal food from the homeless. We won't give in to those who fly racist flags. Oh, you're a dictator. Francis just today came out again, railing against fake news, you see that? Telling Catholics they need to stop with the fake news as he's getting ready to go to Canada on a road show and starring himself. It's all about massive and exposed fake news involving graveyards that don't exist, bodies that don't exist, no evidence whatsoever. But Francis is taking that fake news, <laughs> taking it all the way to town. A major part of the Pope's trip to Canada is to apologize for the past conduct of Christians in regard to the treatment of indigenous peoples in Canada. More than 150,000 native children were forced to attend state-funded Christian schools from 1831 to 1996. The realities of the schools were brought to light last year when the remains of 215 children were found outside of a school in British Columbia. The pontiff on Sunday saying that this trip is only part of the church's attempts to right the wrongs of the past. Well, Candace, this is probably the worst case of fake news uh, that I have ever seen in Canada. Not a single uh, uh, student has been identified. No grave has been identified as belonging to a student. No body has been exhumed. Uh, there is actually no evidence at all that these are the, uh, uh, the graves of students who died at residential school. So um, there is actually nothing to this story about mass graves or unmarked graves, until we get some positive evidence, uh, the, the story should be completely discounted. Keep in mind as we move through this, they're not just talking about abuse that's the problem with the residential school. But the larger issue here is that what we're really talking about, which is why we're doing such a long program on this tonight, is because what Francis is doing is contributing and endorsing the movement that's been knocking down Christopher Columbus statues down here in the States for how long? A long time. Rewriting history. You know, when, when he was asked what more the Pope can do after the, the apology, recent apology in the Vatican, the Canadian flake, Cardinal Michael Cerny, prefect now, he's a very important guy, prefect of the dicastery for promoting integral human development, <laughs> whatever that means, said, quote, it's not a matter of doing more, it's a matter of going deeper. Reconciliation requires human encounter, a ceremony, and a liturgy. Now this is from another 
lunatic Jesuit, made a cardinal, by the way, by Francis, <laughs> who's all in, of course, with the Amazon Synod. Camille Amazonia is a love letter. It's addressed to my beloved Amazonia. And because the Holy Father loves the Amazon, he shares with us his four dreams of the Amazon. So according to the Cardinal over here, uh, Francis is in Canada, he's going to be in Canada in a few days, to conduct a liturgical apology for what this Cardinal calls colonialism, racism, and cultural repression. Now we're getting somewhere. You see? Now we're getting somewhere. Remember at the beginning of the show, Francis was going to apologize for the victims of sexual abuse, right? Cardinal here doesn't mention that. The Cardinal is all about colonial, colonialism, racism, and cultural repression, you see? And of course, <laughs> could there be any doubt, the little ferret up in Canada absolutely agrees with the Cardinal. Mr. Speaker, the ills done to indigenous people over decades and centuries of colonialism in this country uh, are uh, shameful and are something that we need to learn from and move forward on. This is a big story. I think we're going to see a lot, a lot of scandal. I mean, just consider the magnitude of what we're about to see here. Consider it. I know, we get so used to it. You get punched drunk.